Well, welcome everybody uh, to our webinar today. We ask if you are not uh, John, Adam, or Reggie, if you can put yourself on mute just to help manage some of the noise, we'd appreciate that. Uh, my name is John. I'm the CEO of TB12 here. We are a performance lifestyle company founded on the uh, work that Tom Brady and Alex Guerrero have done together over the last 15 years to keep Tom healthy and, uh, and on the field, playing at a high level. Uh, today, I'm thrilled to have the team from Inner City Weightlifting with us to talk a little bit about their program and what they do and uh, give us all an opportunity to learn about the great work they do in the community and maybe talk a little bit about health and wellness and how keeping your mind and body fit can you know, have a big impact on, uh, on people's lives. So maybe with that as a backdrop, uh, John, I can turn it to you for just a a brief overview on inner city weightlifting and the founding of the organization. I'm sure a lot of people would love to learn about that. Happy to, and thank you for having us today. Uh, in short, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We work with people who have been impacted by mass incarceration, specifically people where those same systems of oppression have led to involvement in street violence. Through the gym, through case management, through our career track and personal training, we're not only able to create economic mobility, as great and as important as that is, but more important, we're able to flip power dynamics. We're able to bridge social capital in this really genuine way. In any other scenario, and, and kind of going back a little bit more, in the second someone's labeled a criminal, a gang member, what we're doing is devaluing that person. We're devaluing their life, we're reducing them to a simple moment in time, a statistic, and we're taking away the singularity of that individual. And through personal training, through this career track, through the gym, people in our program, our trainers, they walk into offices, or at least used to walk into offices like BCG, John Hancock, Wayfair, now we're training them virtually. We train young up and coming professionals and tech CEOs in Kendall Square. And they're the valued professionals. And so what happens is that the people in our program, they gain access to new networks and opportunities. Perhaps more important, they don't just change people's lives through these amazing workouts and, and service delivery, but they change people's worldviews at the same time. And all of a sudden, rather than looking at kind of a mess of statistics and as important as that is, people start to see the individuality in some. They don't see mass incarceration as a simple number. They see an individual who wakes up, who, like any of us, loves their family, loves their friends, wants to do everything they can to support the people in their lives, and oftentimes is faced with a lot of difficult choices and avoid of any good options. And that really becomes the vision for ICW going forward is to continue to grow our core services of working with people in our program, of growing our training services, both individual training and corporate training. But to do so in a way where the people in our program are able to, if they want, leverage ICW as a platform to amplify their voice in agency that the criminal justice system has tried to strip from them. Um, and I think in terms of health and wellness, actually, if, if you don't mind me kind of asking the next question, I'd like to turn over to Reggie and Adam. Um, as I know Reggie may start with you, uh, it was health and wellness that led you to actually starting something similar to ICW before we met up back in 2010. Uh, Reg, I think you're on mute. Say that again, John. Uh, just asking you to kind of talk a little bit more about what you were doing uh, before ICW, how you were working with people inside prison and kind of getting them ready through health and wellness and then kind of how we linked up. Oh, um, yeah. Well Basically, I ended up doing 15 years for not telling on a friend that I had no idea what, what, what went on. But just because I was a part of the gang, they thought I knew something. And with all honesty, they knew I was incarcerated and still had to try to get me to tell something that I didn't know. I ended up, I ended up taking 15 years because they was trying to give me 15 in life. While I was in prison, I ended up starting, that's when I began to get my life together. I was on something called build and destroy. Build on everything positive but destroy the negative. And by me doing that, a lot of kids started gravitating towards me. I, I already had a disability, so 
it, it kind of, it was kind of good on my part because it gave them no excuse to do stuff in their life. So when they see me lifting weights and getting stronger and getting more cut up, they was like, man, I want to get down with you. So I'm like, okay, to be down with me, you have to be doing what I was doing. They were then destroyed. Going to school, going to programs, and I got crazy certificates to, to prove my, my backing. I, uh, I did culinary yards. I, I, did, um, I got my apprenticeship for industrial housekeeping. I ended up getting my GED. So I, I, must have, I was in the federal penitentiary. And, and in the federal penitentiary, you have kids from all over the world. So I had kids from all over the place, Los Angeles, Kentucky, Louisiana, it didn't matter. And I had at least about 60 kids doing what I was doing. So when I came home, what John was doing, I was already doing as well. But I didn't know I was building a resume for what John had prepared for me. So when I came home, again, I was lost. So I got into this culinary arts program, um, community service. And I started doing that um, because I didn't want to go back to the hospital. My friends, and it was crazy because after thir I, did, I did 13 years, nine months, seven days. And after that, all that time, my friends still came to the halfway house with guns and drugs, thinking I was still on that same situation. If it wasn't for me taking the time out to say, no, I don't want that, I probably wouldn't be here right now talking to you. But I took that chance on myself and came out positive. And when I got with John, it was on a Friday, I met him. He told me to come down on a Saturday. And man, it's just been beautiful ever since. And what really matters most, man, is like, people don't care. It, you have to care about something to, 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 to motivate yourself to do something about something. If your dog, if, if, if you don't know what to do when Black Lives Matter, but you know what to do when your dog gets hurt or your friend, and, and, and most, most of us, our neighbors and our friends are on our, 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 our to call when our kids get in trouble. So if my, if my, if my, if my teacher calls you and you're my, you're my friend and, and, and you're, they can't get in contact with me and they call you, you know what to do. When your dog get hurt, you know what to do. But when it comes to us, we're not important enough for people to know what to do. They know what to do, but don't want, don't want to do. But John and ICW, they care. And it's been proven for many years because we're still here and we're important. And when a kid finds out they're important to somebody, they're going to show the love back. And John and ICW within myself, we show we care. That's amazing. It's an amazing story, Reggie, and thanks for sharing that. You know, and I love the notion of build and destroy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna incorporate that and share that and pass it on. I think it's a powerful message. I think one thing, one thing I would love to learn a little bit more about is especially the build part of that, right? And so, if you could maybe share a little bit when you were incarcerated and you began this journey of fitness and wellness to improve your life. Like, what was that like when you were incarcerated? What were your opportunities? Or is it, you know, did, were you limited to body weight exercises? Um, or did you have a facility in the, in the prison you were in? Well, how did you begin that journey? And, and how did you first learn about fitness and the things to do? Uh, I learned about fitness in a rough way by going to prison all my life. And um, you have to... Well, for me, because I only can speak about me, I had to isolate myself first, realize who I was, what I want, and where I wanted to go. And once I got them things clear, then I tried for them. And in jail, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's easy. because The hard part is coming out and putting that stuff together. You can put all that stuff together in jail. You got a little bit of time, you can put stuff together. But to, to put it to action, you can't do it till you get to the streets. But that's when obstacles really coming at you. People are coming at you, trying to turn you left, trying to turn you right, and you're trying to go straight. And people don't want, the people that you was with really don't understand that. Or you were so important back then that they don't want you to change. So if I was the shooter, they don't want me to change and go straight because I was the power behind with everything they love. 
So they want me to be there. So they're going to try everything they need to get me there. So I, I had to isolate myself, find out who I was, and then begin. The, the, the realization of it is, of everything is, when, when I was younger, everything my mom taught me wasn't for the streets. When I grew up, I grew up in, 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 in the 60s where it was very racial, way worse than it is now. So I had to maneuver. My fight wasn't against my own kind. It was against the Caucasians. I didn't learn about fighting against my own kind until the 80s when they brought drugs into our lives. But other than that, my, my fight and the fight that's now was totally different. But it ends up in the same way. Poverty, chillings, tail, it all ends up in the same. When coming from this area, it all ends up the same. Thank you for sharing that. Maybe, Adam, could you share a little bit of your story as well? It would be great to hear your story and your journey on this health and wellness. You're on mute. What about now? Can you hear me? Got gotcha. you. All right. So, um, yeah, I grew up I grew up in Boston. I grew up in the Roxbury neighborhood of Boston. Um, you know, I come from a good background. My mother's a, she's a retired school teacher now. My father was also a professor growing up. But um, same same kind of situation, Reggie just explained. They grew up in that era. Well, I grew up, I'm younger. I grew up in the 90s era when I came out. But as far as my parents growing up in that same era, you know, uh, drugs, the drugs was involved uh, as far as my father's life. He kind of destroyed his career of being a professor and everything through the drugs. And, you know, he wasn't around. He did a lot of time. And, you know, growing up, growing up in Roxbury, growing up in Boston without, you know, a positive male in your, in your life. You know, I had uncles too. They were all into drugs, into drugs and stuff. So you don't have a, a male figure in your life. Um, you know, the streets are inevitable. You're going to, going to cross at some, some, type of way and path. Um, you know, I was into sports growing up. You know, that was my positive outlet to, you know, stay away from the drugs and the violence and stuff. But, you know, eventually it caught up to me, you know, being kicked out of school, um, going to school in the neighborhood, you know, having different friends and the thing, things they grew up into and the things I seen growing up, man, at, at a young age. I mean, I seen people get killed you know, at, at like the age of 10 and 11, you know what I mean? Multiple people killed and stabbed and hurt. So, you know, growing up seeing this stuff and, you know, being innocent, it, it, it takes an effect on you, man. It's like PTSD at a young age, man. You know, you don't know what you're going to see next, what you're going to go through. So although I had sports and stuff, I had, you know, my emotional, my emotional triggers, man, seeing somebody get hurt. You know, my dad, all drugs, him not around. You know, my mom's just trying to raise us by herself, uh, three kids. So, you know, I caught the streets a little early. Basketball is my thing, but, you know, at the end of basketball is the street. So, you know, I caught a few charges growing up, drugs and gun charges. And I did a few sentences starting at 17. I did 18 months. And like Reggie said, when you get out, you have it in your head that you're going to do the right thing. But, you know, once you hit the pavement, it's hard, especially when you got those old friends. Same thing. You know, going to prison at 17 and coming out at 18, 19, you know, you're still young. You feel like you miss out on a lot of stuff. I miss out on college, basketball. And first, instead of somebody handing me a basketball, a coach come and see me, man, I got handed drugs and, and guns. So... Right back, same cycle, man. This went on for a while. You know, I, I got about, at 38, I probably got about like 15 years in and out of prison, you know. My last two sentences were four four years for drugs. Um, I did a four-year sentence. I got out. 90 days later, I caught another charge. I bailed out. And this was a, a big change in my life because my next, my last sentence was a four year sentence for drugs. My son, when I went in, I had a son. It was he was one. That was that was a big thing for me. Like you know, leaving leaving somebody that I know needs me, just like I needed a father. 
my goal is to raise him better than I was raised and be there for him like I needed someone there for me. So that that was a big part of my change. You know, um, also friends, friends, I noticed the friends were, they were only there for me when I was doing good in the streets. And then nobody ever talked about change or anything, you know? Um, you know, I was getting tired of that stuff too, you know? And then um, it was just like, you know, at the end of the day, when you're going through this stuff, you the people that 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 are hurting the most, your family, your friends and stuff, you don't we don't think about that. So I started thinking about that too and changing my life. So I was, you know, I was in prison. I did my last state sentence. I same thing Reggie said, I isolated myself from everybody. I stayed away from everybody. I worked out every day, whether it was with the weights or just calisthenics or just running and jogging. I was doing that. I was playing chess and I was reading books and I was I had a notebook of things I was writing down to do when I get out. Number one, get a job, you know, work on paying some bills, helping my mom out. So, you know, it just trying to instill that in my mind. So one day, you know, we got TVs in the cell, so I'm sitting down watching the TV and um, ICW pops up on, on the news with John in there. And he was talking about his program, how he's accepting um, inner city kids that are fresh out of prison and trying to change their lives around. And I seen a couple of guys on it that I know from the neighborhood that haven't been back to prison and they joined this program. They were looking good, so they were still looking nice and big and healthy. And they were probably out for about two or three years. I'm like, I tuned right in. And I'm like, man, this is perfect because I work out. I don't work out to look good. I work out to try to keep my mind right. You know what I mean? Um, through everything that I've been through, man. I've been shot, stabbed. I've been hit by a car. Everything you think about that happened to me, man. And uh, so I work out for the mental. So seeing John this program, I'm like, man, this is this is it right here. Like I put every <laughs> I put him right at the top of the job and all that. I said, I gotta go find this dude when I get out. You know, um, I I didn't care about money or anything. I said, I gotta go find this gym, I gotta go find this program. Me and my son at the time, he was three. I loved him. All the way from Rossbury, we walked to George Gym, which is on um, Dorchester. We walked there. Um, I met Reggie. It wasn't easy getting there because, you know, you got to, you know, we have this. So when you're getting out of the streets, it doesn't mean that everybody else is out of the street. So there's different people with different neighborhoods. You got to make sure, you know, everybody's on the same page. So I wasn't just accepted right away. And that was another challenge for me. Because usually when I'm not accepted right away, I give up. It's like, you know, fuck it, I'm done. I'm back to the streets or whatever. So I didn't give up. I wasn't accepted right away, and I kept calling Reggie. I kept calling like, yo, what's the hold up, man? Like, I need this. So eventually, everything went through. Reggie accepted me, John accepted me. I came there, I showed up. They even allowed me to bring my son there. That was the biggest thing for me. Like, I didn't have a babysitter. I was bringing him with me, you know what I'm like? And they allowed me to bring him there. He sat on the couch, he watched the TV. I, um. I passed the ISSA certification. Um, now, now I'm full time in the gym in Kendall Square. I've been doing this for three plus years now. You know, with ICW, I'm making money. I'm feeling good. I'm healthy. You know, I'm meeting people from different um, ethnics and backgrounds. They accepted me. I'm accepting them, and um, everything's good right now, man. And you know, I appreciate John. I appreciate Reggie for accepting me. This program is really good, and um. I'll do whatever it takes to help build on it. I'll speak for you guys. I'll vouch for you. Like, I'm a person that I've been through a lot. You know what I mean? And every day there's triggers and all that. But nothing nothing can trigger me to leave this this group that I'm in right now, this, this sanctuary, man. It's like I come here, I can take a nap, relax, eat good food, work out, you know, train people. And I do it, you know, the money's good and all that, but I really do this to keep me spiritually tuned myself, man, man, you know, to be prosperous and stuff and be there for my son, man. That's what I really do it for. That's an amazing story. Do you, uh, I have to ask, I'm curious, you got your son on a program yet? He working out already? Uh, what's he's, he about six now? You got him training? Hey, John, yo, this dude, he got pictures. He's wrapping his wrist up like he's about to do shoulder presses. He comes in here, pushes the sled. <laughs> he does everything. He t he tells his mom. <laughs> he tells his mom one day that I gotta go to the gym with dad. I gotta go train somebody. Yeah. So yeah, he he's he's in the game. <laughs> I love that. I love to hear that. You know, it's 
funny. Uh, Tom says if he knew uh, if he knew now or knew then what he knows now and started younger, he'd play till he's in his fifties. So you get your yeah. son going early. He'll be have a long, long, long time. Uh, I know. I know. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about you know it's a, it's an amazing organization and it's just so great to hear your very personal stories and. Uh, you know, you said something, Adam, which I'm curious about, uh, the application process or the uh, process to get accepted into ICW. What's that like? Uh, you know, how does that work? Uh, what can people expect that are coming out of prison? The starting of ICW, it came from this experience that I had my first year of undergrad. I played soccer undergrad graduating in 2005. I did a year of AmeriCorps afterwards. And it was through that year and actually through soccer that I met some young people in a group called MS-13. And I was told, don't go near them. They're too dangerous. Uh, don't waste my time. They don't care. They're not going to change. And here I am, this naive white guy from Amherst, Mass. And it was through soccer that I had the chance to meet Alexan and some of his friends as people, not as you know scary statistics or stereotypes. And I saw firsthand the level of segregation, isolation, racism that they were up against. I saw firsthand the systemic issues, even though I didn't quite realize it at the time. And I also started to see my own participation, my own unwilling and unintentional participation in these systems. Every time I told someone don't cross a certain street because that's what I had been told. I think I'm, what I'm doing is keeping someone safe. In reality, what I'm doing is keeping a community segregated. And I'm playing into the systemic racism. And, and so Alexan and, and, and his friends, and even today, again, to spend my day with, with Adam, Reggie, and, and everyone in our program, I'm con continually becoming more and more aware of my own unintentional involvement and, and, and what I personally need to do change and how I can be a support at the same time and how ICW can be a support. So I say all that because the, the process that we have for getting into the program came from that experience and, and from this really specific focus on people where the safety challenges wouldn't otherwise allow them to participate in other programs. Either they've been kicked out they couldn't get there safely, or the program wasn't even gonna allow them in because of that perceived danger. So as we started doing the work and we started growing as, through word of mouth, one thing became really clear. And that was that the people coming loved coming because of the community and because they could be safe. And listening to that and having that be the heart of this program, this trust, this safety, this community, we listen to people as to how do we grow in a safe way. And one of the things we did from the start was choose not to mix people or groups that wouldn't otherwise want to be around each other. And yes, long term, we'd love it for everyone to get, a, get along. But the reality is that things have happened that can make that really difficult in the short run. So we have the screening process that happens offsite. We keep our locations while we give away the general location. We keep the specific address confidential until someone uh, is interested in the program. And we'll meet with them offsite uh, and, and get to know them, kind of figure out if we don't know where they're from, if from anywhere, where they are from, where they can and can't be, who they can and can't be around. And then we'll check with some of the people in the gym just to make sure we're not accidentally mixing anyone who doesn't want to be around each other. So that can take a little bit of time, unfortunately. I think we'd love to be able to just get someone in right away. But what we never want to compromise is someone's safety. And we err on the side of caution. And most important, we err on, on the, the perspective of the people in our program and, and what they want us to do. Yeah, and you're trying to make a deep impact on people's lives. So sometimes that selectivity um, serves well for that, right? Because you can go deeper with people and just amazing hearing Reggie and Adam's stories. So um, it makes a ton of sense. What about when you uh, think about, you know, and I don't know, John, if this is for you or Reggie or Adam, but I'm thinking a lot about these very personal stories. And, you know, the first time 
you have that experience where communities come together and a business executive who maybe meets with someone from ICW and this business executive may never have met someone who's been incarcerated. What have been your experiences with those first interactions uh, and when communities collide and, and lifestyles collide? Any interesting stories you can share there and how you kind of bridge that gap? Well, starting with kind of like the epitome of success in that, uh, we actually, and we just found this out last year, but two years ago, a group of MIT executive MBAs did a, a, pro a consulting project with us. And it was last year we found out that one of the people in this group requested to not be a part of the group working with inner city weightlifting. And just out of fear? Uh, it was partly out of fear. It was also out of this belief from her perspective that we were training quote unquote gang members to become stronger and, and that that is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. While if that's what was told me, I'd say good, go to another group. <laughs> to MIT's credit, they actually required this person to work with us. Today, she leads racial justice and, and criminal justice reform issues within her company because of the people she met at ICW. That's amazing. Our trainers, the people in our program, our students, they changed her world view. And so when we talk about these connections, they're not always kind of happening in, in, in this kind of vacuum of outside influence. But what makes personal training so powerful is that it takes away this kind of social cause and puts it more about valuing someone as a professional. When you value someone as a professional, whatever fears you have of their background, of the stereotypes that ha have kind of warped your, your perspective or perception, now you're just going in for a workout and you meet someone. And before long, again, this is kind of what I was trying to allude to earlier, you don't look at the statistics, the stereotypes, the false narratives, you see the singularity of an individual and you care for that person. And you start to look at a social issue, not through a lens of criminality, but a lens of humanity. And that not only creates a changed perspective, but it changes behavior. And we've heard multiple other stories of people not crossing the street to avoid, but crossing the street to say hi. And that's ultimately really what we are about as an organization. And, and you know, to concisely answer your question, the way we go about it is we just pitch the training service. And yeah. it, it's not about, uh, you know, certainly there are, you know, we're talking to a foundation or we're, we're talking about kind of like this. Of course, we're going to load it more with the social mission. Uh, but our services, that, that's all about just getting a great workout with a great trainer. And that's how we start to uh, uh, connect people. That being said, it's not, it didn't start as a smooth journey. You know, when we started 10 years ago or 11 years ago now, we were protested everywhere we tried to open up. Eventually we get a gym open. We get a few people trying to come in and, and train with us. And, you know, they're driving like 60 minutes to train with us because they're so sold on this social mission that they, they want to be a part of it. They leave the gym, not just with a great workout, but this more intimate connection with the organization as a whole. And they start telling their friends. And what happens is that if you look at it as a spectrum, people so sold on this side, on the social mission, they'll drive however far to get to the gym. On this side, you got the people that say, Dorchester is the most dangerous place in Boston, We're working with the most dangerous people in Boston. No way I'm going. That initial group, they, they meet people in the middle, people who are hesitant but willing because their friends are coming. They're the group that comes in and they become that person from the MIT Executive MBA program, someone that has this complete shift in their worldview. And they become our biggest ambassadors as they start to reach people on, this, on kind of that more extreme end of the spectrum that we can never reach ourselves. Yeah, that's cool. One of the things that I just find so special about what you're doing is um, the problems that result in people getting incarcerated can be so complex, right? And Reggie and Adam know what they've lived it. There's socioeconomic issues, there's education issues, there's drug issues, there's family issues, there's perception issues, there's so much. 
But fitness is so common for all of us. It's such a simple way to try and solve a very complicated problem. And I think there's some real, I think there's some real magic in there, which to me is what makes what you guys do so, so incredibly special. Um, you know, both Reggie and Adam talked a little bit about when they got out, this notion of like isolating themselves, right? And pushing some of the bad away. And I'd be interested now that you guys have been involved with ICW for so long and your trainers and you've used fitness to better your lives. Have any of those people from your past that you originally isolated yourself from uh, when you got out, have they come back into your lives at all? And have you used fitness at all to change their lives? Is there a, is there a multiplier effect within your community at all? My, 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 for me, my isolation was only in prison. Um, and that was probably the only like, probably the first couple of years. After that, I was open for everything. Once I found, like I said, once I found out who I was and what I wanted and where I was going to go, it was a wrap after that. Now all I got to do is stay on that course. And stay on that course allowed me to gra have these young, young kids gravitate towards me. And the, it's a bad thing, but it's a good thing that my record, like when you go to the federal penitentiary or any jail, you have the inmates that do your paperwork. So when they see my paperwork coming in, that tells them who you are or what type of person you're going to be. So now when they actually meet you and see that that's not what you're about, this is what you're about, or that you've changed, they allow you to change. But see, because they don't know me. On the streets, it's different because I done done stuff to people in my neighborhood. So now for me to change, they're not willing to change at, at the same time. But it gave me time with, with that 13 years, nine months, seven days, doing all that time, coming up, going to jail at 30, coming home at 43, all that time had changed. So whatever I did to people, maybe they was mad about it or maybe wanted to do something. But again, knowing who I was back then to who I am today. Do they really want to challenge that or say, well, it's not really worth it. And most of them from, for, most, for me say it's not worth it. I'm 54 years old. So the most, the most part, most of them say it's not worth it. But you still get the stairs because you probably put somebody in the wheelchair, beat somebody up real bad. So they still got them feelings, but they're leaving them alone. So again, if you're mad at me, if I did something to you or I did something, you did something to me, that we have a problem but we're going to keep going on path. As, long, as soon as one of us take a step towards one another, that's where the problem becomes. Yeah. But again, for me, it, for me it, I, after maybe the six, first six months, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't isolate myself no more. When kids started gravitating towards me, I started pulling them in because I, I, I already seen what the institution was like and they don't care about us. So I'm, starting, I'm trying to get these kids to change before they get out and do the same things because I've already been where they're trying to go. So I, 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 it's like I, I, I've seen the future for them, and I want to change. So I, I pulled them in, and with all honesty, I'm still in contact with most of the kids that I was involved with in jail. And I can go on my Facebook and show all of them are doing well. All of them are doing well. None of them has been back to jail. All the kids that I put under my wing, they're all out here. They don't want to get more degrees. They're doing great. And that, that, and they. And that's what ICW has been doing for us. That's great. Really an amazing story. What's, um, what's a way that people can help? So obviously, um, we'll, we'll put this up obviously on our YouTube. A lot of people will see this over time. What's, what's ways that people out there can help? Uh, to, to start, sign up for training with Adam or any of our trainers. Um, <laughs> I think it's one of the easiest and best ways to get involved with us is that we're kind of fortunate as a nonprofit that what we're doing isn't 
taking place kind of like behind closed doors to society. Uh, you know, we're actually offering a service. So I think it's, you know, someone can individually get involved. They can help get their company involved. Um, yeah, obviously we're a nonprofit. Donations are always helpful. Uh, and then last, you know, it's, it's spreading awareness. It's, it's listening and figuring out what internal behaviors we all might need to change um, and, and be unaware of too. Again, I'll, I'll point to myself. Um, I continue in the way I spoke 10 years ago when we launched, I had all the same intentions, but it's very different from the way I talk today because I'm continually learning my own unintentional and un known participation in a lot of the issues that, that we are seeing unfolding in society. Um, so I think the last one in addition to spreading awareness is a willingness to listen and, and look internal. Um, Adam, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Yeah, you know, just being more, getting more people to join the program. Um, you know, the more this program gets heard, the more people will join. Uh, going back to the question you asked, too, as far as, um, you know, those people that I had to isolate from, I still I still see a lot of a lot of people, a lot of my old friends. I mean, some of them, still, some of them are still friends, you know, they just, what it is is when you, when you show, show people that you're really stepping up, you, you know, you're going to make this adjustment, make this move for yourself. Um, either they're going to respect it or not. It's up to you to just continue on. So it's all about who you are, too. Like, I always, one thing I did get good out of my father, he told me, you know, be an old man. You know what I'm saying? Go up, be an old man. Make some decisions for yourself, man. Even when, you know, some of the decisions might be wrong, make sure it's a decision that you're comfortable with. So I made the decision for myself to change. People around me, they accept it, you know. Um, I don't, it's, 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 it's a big step, though, coming from where we come from, man, you know. But, um, yeah, the more the more people that come, you know, come check us out and have faith in us, man, we'll, we'll show you guys what we're really about. Just, you know, we'll give you the verbal part right now, but when, when people walk in this gym, you know, white, black, Asian, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's, I'm comfortable now. You know, before, I wasn't comfortable speaking to somebody of a different ethnic because I'm like, they're not going to understand me. They're going to look at me and see all these scars and see all these tattoos and see the way I talk. And I'm like, oh, whatever, you know? So I already had, I already had a complex, you know what I mean? And I know they probably had a complex too. Like, oh, I don't, you know, that person might be, you know, they're too intimidated. But now that I got this skill, uh, when people walk through this door, I know how to speak, I know how to present myself. Not really too much of a change either, just being assertive, you know, let my voice be heard clearly, you know, and um, when people walk through this door and they see me, we talk, and then when we do the online corporate trainings and I, I get on there, my voice is open now. I think they get it quick. They get the message quick, you know, especially what's going on in the world today, man, you know. I, I I started going to school. I started out of school in a, a MECO program, you know, at a young age. And I was going to school with Newton. There was a lot of racism there. I dealt with racism. You want to know what's so crazy? It's not as bad as it is. It wasn't as bad as it is now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but people are understanding that, you know, it's not really a, it's not something that's going to, really be, uh, you know, it's not something that's going to last long, man, you know? So people, you can't just judge everybody, you know? And I think the more people that we get coming in from different walks of life and we speak to them, they speak, they speak to us, man. They get to know, man, we're like the program that's going to, you know, we're going to bring some power into the world, you know? Yeah, it's great. And, you know, it's, it's just back to the simple idea you know, even Adam, going back to when you were, you know, in Metco and Newton, like you guys are using fitness, being healthy as the bridge. And I think that's important. Like, 
super impressed with what you guys are doing. And I know on behalf of the whole TB12 team, um, we're super, super excited to find more ways to help you guys and get more involved and uh, really help you guys spread you know, a really powerful message and help people get better, help people uh, become the best version of themselves and really give everyone a chance um, to be to be the best they can be. And I appreciate you guys all taking the time to share your story with us here. And, you know, obviously, uh, we'll all be talking more, Team TV 12 and Team ICW, but thank you for sharing your story with us today. And uh, look forward to talking more to you guys. Thank you for having us, and we're excited for the opportunity to work together. All right, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Adam, Reggie, thank take you. care, guys. See you, John, thank you. Hey, everybody have a good one. Stay all safe. Right. All right, what up, Reg? What's up, Playboy? How you feeling? Uh, cooler, cooler. All right, all right. All right, y'all.